Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Hey slash x slash. The kids are back in school and the tarot reading and demon summoning asking a magician anything morons that ruin this board are slowly being weeded out. So in the spirit of actual relevant posts being back sooner rather than later, let's get a personal experience thread going. Preferably recent experiences that are still fresh in your mind, as opposed to childhood experiences that sometimes are odd natural occurrences seen as supernatural to a young mind. I'll of course be courteous enough to start. I've posted a story about a month ago pertaining to my new house and how the bathroom in particular seems to have some sort of activity, such as the sliding doors opening on their own, in turn waking me up to actually witness it abruptly stop moving. But due to recent events I think there's cause to believe there is something in my house that tends to prefer that room. Going back to before we moved in two months ago, we had an apartment in Indy Atlantic, Florida. I'm currently waiting on my buddy to finish remodeling his master bedroom so I moved out of his house temporarily and back with my father. He goes out of town twice a month for a week for work, and I watch over the house. He had just gotten approved by the VA for a home loan and bought the house we now live in at Indian Harbor Beach, literally right down the street. Since we lived in an apartment, I had no room to do my daily workout, so I'd usually go to the public football soccer field for jogging and all the basic weight-free workouts you can do. But seeing as my dad bought a house with a backyard, we were waiting for him to come back from his trip before moving in. I used the key he left and went to the new house for my workout. I did a walkthrough as I had never had time to check it out with my dad as I worked two jobs. Pleasantly surprised at the sparkling new condition of everything in the house, I began opening doors to all the rooms to decide which one I would temporarily own. I mostly wanted it because the other room that is on the other side of the bathroom, yes, they're connected by a bathroom, it's called a Jack and Jill bathroom, had a regular wood door, but also big glass double doors that left much to be desired as far as privacy goes. So while inspecting the room, I went into the bathroom, shut the sliding door behind me, and opened the one to the other room, went in and shut the other door behind me. I then walked out the double doors and shut them, and went outside to the backyard to start my workout. Afterwards, I planned on taking a shower and had brought a towel and body wash, so I went to the bathroom through the double door room and stopped in my tracks. Both sliding doors were completely open. They don't glide super easily by any means and the house is completely level. So I decided to shrug it off since all the doors were locked and I knew nobody was in the house. After the shower, I went out to the hallway and went to leave. A closet door was open that hadn't been. It's small and has a single light bulb that didn't work. And as I was looking up at the bulb, I saw the entrance to the attic with the plank that seals it over halfway open. I was upset and thought a squatter may have been in my dad's new house and though I was completely unarmed I turned my cell phone flashlight on and used the shelves as a ladder and peeked up in the attic. It was cleaner than expected and not very creepy at all, thank God. From where I could see every corner, there was nothing to be seen anywhere. I just left and decided to forget about it. Fast forward to moving day and meeting my neighbors. They're very nice and social and talk to us every time we run into each other outside. They met my cousin who helped us move and my dad. Fast forward a month. Dad's out of town and I'm leaving for work in the morning and I'm pretty late and in a hurry. I had left the garage light on all night on accident as I had done laundry pretty late. He was taking his trash can back in and said while he was walking his dogs around 2 a.m. last night he said he was surprised I let my little sister stay up so late and play in the garage, which has huge windows facing the street so you can basically see the entire inside of it at night with the light on. He asked why he never met her before and I just thought he was messing around and kinda laughed and said have a good day. He of course looked confused as I backed out of the driveway, as someone would when you completely ignore a question they asked in all seriousness. Over the past couple weeks the bathroom doors sometimes wake me up from sliding open and banging once they open completely, and there's never anyone there. Which leads me to last night around 7pm, when I got back from work. My neighbor was sitting out in his driveway with his wife and dogs having a couple beers. They invited me and I of course accepted. After some small talk he said something that freaked me out and still has me looking over my shoulder every minute. My bathroom oddly enough has a tall window right behind the toilet facing the fence in our backyard on the side of the house. Over the fence you can clearly see into his garage. He said he saw my little sister watching him from the bathroom window paint some trim for his walls. He said he waved at her and smiled. 
but she just kept staring at him. And then he said she started to make him nervous as she didn't go away, so he closed up shop and went inside. I asked if he had been drinking that day and he said not at all. It was only noon and he never has a drink before dinner, and asked why I asked. I told him that I didn't have a little sister. Surprisingly, he just said, well, that explains why she looks so much like the old neighbor's daughter. Looks like you've got yourself a ghost. And he and his wife laughed it off. So apparently a little ghost girl lived here before too, and he thought it was the old neighbor's daughter. I'm glad they found it so funny, but I have to be here alone for another week. And last night as I was pulling in the garage, light came on by itself, so it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Well, that's my story. Let's hear all of yours slash x slash. Okay, so recent experience I'm still dealing with, hoping for a bit of advice. About a year ago, my family moved into a house built in the 40s, a nice place, it's got some bumps, but good. Apparently this place has a bit of history though, so this place is in a small town. We moved here for my job, and it turns out one of my co-workers used to live here, and she told me all sorts of stories about the place and her time here. I don't believe most of them. I'm a full skeptic, and I brush off supernatural things as lies or something easily explainable. Anyway, fast forward a month or so, nothing really happens. One morning, I get off work, and I'm relaxing after a 12-hour shift, and the basement door slams really loud. Obviously, I jump because everyone is in bed. It's like 6.15, and the kid doesn't wake up for a few more hours. I go investigate nothing but a bad feeling, and the hairs on the back of my neck raise. That's it for a while. No more noises, nothing. I wrote it off as pressure change in the house, causing the door to jar violently. Next thing is noises in the attic, like footsteps. I thought it might be animals, so I went to the little trapdoor thing in the ceiling with my older sister when she came to visit. Unfortunately, the access is too narrow for me or my sister to get our shoulders through. This part is a bit odd. I was able to shine a light up there, and the part of the attic this goes to is a tiny little room with no doors. Just a tiny room, but the noises I was hearing were coming from another part of the attic. I searched and searched, but there is no other attic access anywhere. So the noises continue, and eventually become white noise in the background after a few more months. Nothing else happens again for a while. Two months ago, the biggest thing happened. The thing I have no explanation for. So, it's about 10 p.m., my best friend is coming to crash for the weekend, and my sister and her boyfriend are coming too. We're all going to play D&D. &D. Good times. Sister and boyfriend arrive, we get our character sheets out, and make sure everything is in order for playing. The moment my friend shows up, the smell of natural gas fills the house, strong. Everyone's getting lightheaded, it's like a gas pipe burst. We head outside, and call the gas company's emergency line. Guy shows up eventually, he can smell it too, but none of his devices pick up anything. Eventually, with a confused look, he says it might be the sewer line is backed up. He leaves, giving the okay to go back in. We go back in, and the smell is gone, like it was never there. Q sister's boyfriend wanting to play ghost hunter occult master. Dude straight-faced suggests catching a stray cat and sacrificing it in the basement, saying the blood will make the spirit happy. As a middle ground, I suggest going down to the basement and looking around. We don't have much to see, but at some point I stabbed my hand on something, not sure what, and I lost quite a bit of blood on the dirt floor. He says that will work in lieu of the cat. I thought he was joking, but he's straight-faced. I go upstairs and clean up. Now, since that night, there's been really loud scratching noises upstairs every day and night. It sounds like a rat on steroids. But when I go up to check, there's silence. I'm getting sick of it. When I go to bed at night, I hear walking around in and around my bedroom. I'm willing to accept that something is happening beyond the norm, but I don't know what to do about it. Any help would be great. I'm a little desperate at this point, and I'll take whatever I can get. I have memories of a funny man who would lean over my crib and make wacky faces and wiggle his fingers around. I thought he was super funny, and he would make me smile and laugh and laugh. I forgot about him until years later when I see pic related on the wall of my middle school history class. The funny man looked almost exactly the same as Gandhi, but slightly fatter. How come I haven't seen him in family photos or heard anyone talk about him? He must have been a really trustworthy cool guy if he was allowed in the house and around my crib. Recently I visited my aunt for the first time in a while. She now works from home in a small office where my crib used to be. 
in a newer recent addition to the house added around 50 years ago. A new room made out of logs we creatively call the Log Room. So we chat for a while and I ask if she has any spooky stories since I visited last. One afternoon, she woke up laying on the floor of the log room experiencing a really bad headache. A man was telling her, You need to go get up and ask your husband for help. You are having a stroke. You need to get up and ask your husband for help. You need to get up. You are having a stroke. You need to go to your room and tell your husband you are having a stroke. So she mustered up the strength to get up and got the help she needed. Sure enough, she had a stroke but got help in time to prevent it from getting worse. I had a feeling in my gut about who the man telling her to get up was. I asked her if it was a funny little Indian man wearing round glasses and her face turned white. She asked how did I know. She had not described what he looked like to anyone yet. It seemed like a total shot in the dark but I was 100% right. I told her it might have been the man who made funny faces to me when I was a kid. She said that when I was in that room I would be so happy to be there. She told me that I used to point at nothing and say, the man in the glasses is funny. Looking for any similar experiences of continual contact to help me understand what I believe to be continual or episodic contact with ETs. My experiences have been happening for a long time with varying vagueness and have left me with many questions. I'm familiar with the basic ideas behind the UFO phenomenon as a result of trying to establish my own experiences, but most of what's relevant to me is over a decade old from testimonies akin to Strieber's collective work. I found interesting parallels, but I'm more curious about others with encounters as recent as some of mine. From the beginning. The first events I don't recall myself but have been described to me. When I was very young, I lived in New Mexico in the foothills. My sibling and parents told me that on more than one occasion they had entered my room late at night, 2 to 5 a.m., to find me opening and crawling in through my window from the outside. I was in a trance-like state and got back into bed without speaking. I don't recall this happening and find it hard to believe if it were not corroborated by multiple people. I was very young and had typical fears about dark nights without street lights and with coyotes. I traveled a lot. The next place I lived I saw my first UFO. It was the size of a quarter at arm's length and appeared in the middle of the day, arcing across the sky very slowly. It was bright orange and left a reddish, flickering tail longer than the orb itself. It literally looked like a fireball. It took about five minutes to cross and eventually fade out of sight. It did not cross the horizon. I had watched meteor showers whenever I could in New Mexico, and this was not a meteor I knew. I rushed into the house and shouted to get everyone outside to see the thing. Nobody seemed interested, even though I was doing everything in my power to just get them outside for a moment. That moment felt dreamlike. No matter what I did, no one budged. They had no reason not to, and the behavior was immediately odd. I brought this up to my family recently and got a puzzling response. They said that whatever happened was for me to see only. They said they felt a resistance to allow themselves to see this thing. The next part is weirder. I was looking for answers and went to the NASA website to see if it might have been a deorbiting satellite or ISS ferry burning up. I was already fascinated by space topics and the NASA site seemed a logical starting point. I immediately found a plausible explanation. An article about a structural component to some launch that would have crossed my part of the US and splashed down near Australia. I was at ease but honestly surprised to have found an answer so easily. The article was published that day and was the first thing I found on their older blog-style website when I pulled it up. Literally the next day I could not find the article. I searched for keywords, then I went into the browsing history. Everything was there except for the page with the article. No 404, nothing. Any trace of what I know I read vanished. Recalling this now only compounds the more serious, tangible events I've encountered. When I started attending high school, I lived on the top floor of a two-story house with a basement. I slept with my head next to an air vent that led directly into the basement furnace. At some point, I started hearing shuffling sounds from this vent. Okay, I know what you're thinking. This could be explained in a number of ways. Bear with me. The sound would last a few moments and repeat like someone moving things around, 
then a pause of irregular length and continue for an hour or so before stopping altogether and not returning until the same time some other night. I started expecting these sounds. They always started after 3 a.m. and were irregular but consistent. The sound was like someone walking into heavy cardboard boxes, there were many down there, and pushing them around. It was loud, clear, and described an intentional motion taking place. I was weirded out but not scared since I thought maybe it was one of my dogs, or even someone trying to remove the bars from our basement windows to break in. These noises continued for months, sometimes stopping for a week but always eventually returning. When they grew frequent, I would sit up at night and wait for the sound, and it would come. I had people over many times, and we would listen together to the noises trying to draw up an explanation. We would overcome our creeped-out fear and venture into the basement but find nothing, then return upstairs only to hear the sounds resume. Nothing was ever out of place, but the sounds described a commotion. It was no furnace, no animal, and several of my friends listened to these anomalies without any idea what was happening at the origin of the sound. The next bizarre event took place when I was at the beach with a group of friends at night. We watched a bright spotlight move up the shore towards us, and we thought it must be a helicopter searching for something. It was a bright light source in the sky, and we could see trees and sand being illuminated by it. It was too bright to be on a drone. It moved closer to us until it was no more than 100 meters away, but it was totally silent. Everyone became scared at this point, and we left quickly. There was no explanation for what the four of us saw. No, we weren't using drugs or drinking. Fast forward to senior year. One night I had a very, very vivid dream. This is what happened. I heard our back door open. I was overcome with an instinctual defensiveness and grabbed a bat from the corner of my room and an air pistol. I must have thought it might be enough to scare a robber. Of course, I was not acting logically. I walked past the rooms of everyone else asleep and went downstairs alone not something a cognizant person would do. As I did, my memory became extremely vivid. I recall exactly how the stairwell was lit by the streetlights outside through a small window. To this day, the visual stuck with me. The angles were so realistic, the scene had that much added vividness in my memory. I was scared and went the long way through the house to the back door so that I wouldn't have to turn a corner and be facing the doorway at point blank. I didn't know why, but I wanted to see what was there before I got remotely close to it. Then I saw it. Through the kitchen and foyer door, down a small set of steps to the landing were two figures coming up the steps towards the kitchen. One of them was taller than I was and still on the bottom landing, so must have been at least seven feet tall. The other figure was small and looked like it was wearing a tunic. I thought it looked like a frail old man and its skin was gray. I opened my mouth to scream and as I did, I fell over hitting the dining table and instantly blacking out. Inexplicably, I have a mental image of being right next to these figures, and in this mental snapshot I can see both of the figures vividly. The tall one is a literal man in black, with earpiece, shades, and black tie. The small figure is gray and wrinkled, not four feet tall, with large, wide-set eyes. It lacks any other defining features. Immediately behind them was the back door, and beside them way to the basement. I immediately woke up after collapsing in the dream. I've never in my life woken up like this, even in the harshest of nightmares. I was on my back. I never sleep on my back. With my hands palmed down at my sides and when I opened my eyes, the world slowly opened up from total blackness. I immediately began to sweat, drenching the bed in sweat. I had not been sweating at all before the moment I woke up. I was weirded out by this dream but didn't let it bother me much. Until two days later, I brought it up to my family in conversation. My sibling looked horrified. They had sleep paralysis that same night and described being locked in place in their bed, unable to turn their head as noises came from downstairs and something unseen opened their door and entered their room. They described seeing post-it notes on the walls and ceiling with gibberish written on them. My parents said they also had a memory of waking up, but no others. They lost time. Many years later, I brought this up again to my sibling who was in the house and experienced paralysis. They have a memory from an earlier night of seeing two figures on our front porch at night and me going out to meet them. They remember this image, but it doesn't fit with anything else we ever talked about. 
Since then, I have seen lights in the sky twice, both times with other witnesses. Most recently, I saw entire formations of spindly lines floating above the horizon and took turns watching them with a partner through binoculars for half an hour. The last event made the news in my city and was chalked up to being seagulls. Literally, even the newscasters said they doubted this story. I know there are unexplained things happening everywhere. I feel that only a few people are allowed to see, touch, or otherwise remember them. A dark, tall figure inside my dreams. So basically that. I'm used to having really bad dreams. I don't call them nightmares. Things like escaping from something or being inside a forest filled with spiders and other insects. Being trapped inside an old house, etc. It's nothing new, but recently I've been experiencing this thing called sleep paralysis more than ever. Inside my dreams, several times in one night, makes me really uncomfortable, naturally. I feel a presence in my room. I feel a weight in my chest. I sleep in total darkness, so even if I try, I can't see nothing. I found out how to calm me down without waking up, though. I'm a lucid dreamer. A very few times I've been able to change some things inside my dreams. However, when this happens, I try to fight back the fear, keeping calm until it happens, breathing faster until I wake up, or screaming louder inside my head to the other voice I hear. So I have been having these dreams very similar to each other. Very long, detailed, and realistic. When I start doubting if it is a dream, I can even feel my fingers and my breath. Even I can smell things kind of confuses me. It has happened twice this week. The dream itself is normal. How it ends, it's weird. However, there's some similarities. I went inside an old house with some people I don't recall. There's a presence and it is following me. I find a bed and I start to feel really tired. But I'm scared the thing will catch me. I fall asleep inside my dream and I start to feel paralyzed. And I see this dark, tall, bony figure in the corner of the room, getting closer until I wake up. The first time I could even touch it before waking up. These dreams followed with some recent events that have happened to my mother in the house, like her phone being thrown from the table. Well, I'm doubtful about all that stuff. A recent discomforting experience. Okay, here goes nothing. I bought a house dirt cheap in Spain in a tiny village in the countryside surrounded by olive and almond trees, around three hours by car northwestish from Barcelona. Forty people live here, Max. The type of old village where each house rubs shoulders with a house on either side, and most houses overlook the narrow road that cuts through the middle. The houses outnumber the people four to one. The majority of the houses are dilapidated, but a few have been brought up to be renovated, and a few have already been done up beautifully. Surrounding the village are dirt track roads that cut up and down the countryside in rings to allow access to the olive, almond trees, and grapes. The further from the town, the less used the tracks become. If you go far out enough, they begin to blend into the wilderness completely. Think olive trees in rows in well-tended plots, lines of immaculately irrigated vineyard versus gradual descent into scrubland wilderness. Steep areas where gnarled older trees have been left to look after themselves and sort of valleys full of the various farming detritus of hundreds of years. It gets pretty thick. Buildings made of stone, half collapsed and completely derelict are a common sight the further out you go. Old barns left to fall into themselves sort of thing after having outlived their use for whatever reason. March of time, etc, etc. A few years ago I splashed out on a lovely thorn touring bike complete with a Sun 28 Dynamo hub. Believe it or not, this is relevant. I'd never used it properly before, only to charge my iPod while solo touring. But it's capable of doing phones and cameras, charging battery packs, whatever. I like to cycle and have a favorite route or two picked out that cuts a loop through the surrounding area around my village. I could cycle all day and never see more than a soul or two, maybe a farmer or another cyclist. In the summer, that is. Pick related, just not yet. Typing as I go, so bear with me. Now winter has rolled around. There's nobody, not even during the day. The trees have been tended to, and the vines have been clipped ready for spring. It also gets dark very early. Too dark to see without a light unless the moon is out and there aren't any clouds. Otherwise, it's actually more than bright enough to see. Funny how quickly your eyes adjust in the dark. The moon can be really bright. Anyway, since I have the hub already and want to continue getting my cardio in, I bought up a light that plugs directly into the hub itself and then gets screwed into the bottom of the forks, below the stem of the bike. Headset? It worked perfectly, but it's bright. A searing white when you're outside in the pitch dark. 
I guess my eyes are trying to get as much light as possible because in no time at all I was having to squint. Kinda ruins the experience when you can feel a headache coming on. During one of my many night cycles I used my big brain and started to wonder how I might find a solution and came up with the pick in the OP, orange shampoo bottle, with a rectangle cut out. I sandwiched it between two old bits of marble kitchen countertop and put the whole lot on top of my wood-burning stove until the plastic was pressed flat between them with pressure and heat, waited until I started to smell the plastic and set it aside to cool, worked like a charm, held the plastic to the light and drew a crude circle. Cut it out, hey presto. Even stuck inside the light housing without any tape or glue, somehow a perfect press fit. The light stutters and dims a bit while going up the steepest sections of track, the type you can only really handle in the lowest, highest gear, sitting down but never goes out completely, a sort of dim strobing that's still enough to keep on track or hit anything. I'm used to walking home in the dark and haven't been scared since I was little, but it's worth saying I used to be deathly afraid to the point where I'd have to run to the bathroom at night with my heart in my mouth. My imagination would run off with me and not even give me anything specific to pin my fears on, just helpfully leaving me with a feeling of abject primordial terror at the thought of having to look down the stairs while I ran along the landing. Haven't felt anything like that in years, not since I was a child. Never any problem while I went out cycling in the dead of night either. It was always just fun and peaceful until a couple of nights ago when I switched to the orange light. As soon as I left the light of the streets in the village behind me, I felt the beginnings of that familiar churning in my stomach from when I was little, the same dread and apprehension. I pushed aside the feeling, kind of like, wow, this is nostalgic, feeling something I hadn't for so long and then steeled myself against it. I didn't manage completely. It overwhelmed me in short bursts the same way it used to. With darkness all around me, I started to freak out and pedal a bit harder after about 20 minutes or so. The thing about having the light attached to the handlebars is that it points where you're turning, which isn't always the direction you're going in. Weird to say that, but it's extra obvious in the dark. Sometimes you turn away from the direction you're going to sort of then turn into it. I suppose if any of you are cyclists, you get what I mean. So my mind is racing and I'm fighting this sick feeling of regret, stronger than I feel I have any right to be feeling anything which only makes me freak out more. Each time I turn left or right, the track in front of me vanishes directly into darkness to illuminate to the left or right of me, shining light where there wasn't any previously, and leaving the middle of the track completely dark. I don't want to shine light into the bushes and trees to the left or right. I kept imagining what it would be like to see something horrible standing there looking at me. Trying to breathe properly at this point, the night air is cold and hurting the back of my throat, and I'm generally feeling as if I'm trapped in some kind of nightmare, a knot in my stomach and a sick feeling that won't leave me no matter how I try to rationalize. Then I reach the steepest part of the track, exactly in the middle of the loop, the furthest point from where I want to be, and the light of course starts to dim and strobe as the hub struggles to deliver enough power to the light, clenching the bars tight, trying to navigate over a part of the track that's solid stone where the earth has washed away. I hear a familiar sound, the sound of a bit of bush or a twig or something stuck in the back wheel somewhere. Tink, 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 tink. I don't want to stop, but it's getting worse, and I know the light has four minutes of stationary stop time, so the information said anyway. Stop. Swing my leg over and holding my bike up with one hand, I try and find whatever it is to yank it free and of course can't see anything because all the light is going forwards and I'm standing in the dark, frantically trying to get a hold of whatever's stuck to yank it free. I started laughing out of fear. The second I stopped laughing and pulled this bit of whatever free from wherever it was stuck, I turned back to jump onto the bike and am met with what I can only describe as the source of my fear up to that point. It was like the queasy fear fitted like a glove. This is why I was afraid. This is where the fear was coming from. A huge cube of some description, dark and taller than I am, had materialized in front of me, completely silently. But the instant I clapped eyes on it, it started to make a sound like a distant rock slide. A rumbling, grating, muted crushing of falling rocks is as good as I can describe it. The noise didn't vary in pitch or anything. It just continued while I stood there feeling like I was about to leave my own body out of terror. I screamed a scream that I had no idea I was capable of making. I sounded like an animal even to myself and pissed myself on the spot. My bladder just gave up on me. The orange light lit it up perfectly vaguely reflective, 
and even though it looked like a square, a perfectly two-dimensional square, I had a perfect sense it was three-dimensional. My scream ripped something inside me and I threw my bike around and jumped on and pedaled for my life, feeling like some kind of automaton with jerky movements. I could barely keep the bike going in a straight line to start with, having to kick off the ground on each side. Even though I was hurtling down the track, the sound didn't get any further away, or any closer, thank God. It just stuck with me until I was always back into town, as if it was following me at the same distance it had appeared at until vanishing as completely as it had appeared. I only turned to look once the sound had stopped, but when I did, it was gone too. Anyway, suffice to say, my night cycling days are over. I can't even tell anyone or I'll start babbling and get sectioned. The fear has left me though. No matter how I touch back on the memory, there's no fear associated with it. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos. There's also a Rumble archive as a backup.